morning, church. Welcome to Riverside Community Church, our Sunday worship service. So glad that you joined us this morning. This time, if you're able, please stand for our call and response. Please read the text that is in bold and italicized. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases. Who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Let us worship God together. So good to worship together this morning. Um, the first song that we're going to sing may be new to some. But the, it's actually described the scene in Revelation chapter 5. I'll, I'll try my best to summarize it, but I, I highly recommend that you read it yourself. Um, but there's a scene that the Apostle John, he's seeing in heaven, and um, there's a scroll that represents the rule of God for all eternity. And it was sealed up. The angel said, could not find anybody in heaven or earth to open that scroll, or even to look at it. And the Apostle John started to weep loudly. And then one of the elders not Elder, Stan, Elder David, one of the elders in heaven actually says, weep no more, and he pointed to the lamb who looked at as he was slain. He went and he grabbed the scroll, and it's from that point on that all of heaven exploded into worship and song, and when we worship together, we're not just worshiping in this room, we're joining in that everlasting song. When we worship together, we're also going from a place of weeping, knowing, just wondering whether anybody is worthy to help us unwind it and uh, unwrap the will of God and just transitioning from that place of hopelessness to that place of hope and, and worship in Christ. So let's, let's sing this song together. And it's also a call and response song, so I'm going to sing the first line. You echo after me, but you'll get it, hopefully. But um, let's sing this together. <laughs> that you can see it all. Do 
today we also come before you to thank you because that throne is a throne of grace. Jesus, today we come before you humbly. We can also come before you with confidence because we know that we'll receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. Jesus, today Whoever lives in peace, whoever lives in peace for me. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thanks.
Good morning, everyone, once again. Uh, welcome to our Riverside Community Church Sunday worship service. So glad that you joined us this morning. At this time, let's uh, pass along the peace to one another. So left and right, front and back, let's say peace be with you. Peace be with you. Happy Sunday. Peace be with you. If you're joining us for the first time, we welcome you in the name of a Christ, uh, in the name of the Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. Please join us. Uh, after our worship service in the fellowship hall across, uh, across from the sanctuary for a time of food and fellowship. We have some announcements. Um, our Lent fasting chain is still going on and we would like to um, have everyone sign up. And, you know, if you're fasting separately, uh, if you could just kindly, you know, uh, insert your name and we would like to just be encouraged to one another and together. And so... Please see our um, email update um, as well as, you know, the uh, link up here or where you can even uh, simply go to our website to see the link and just go on the link and uh, if you're fasting any meals or any activities, things like that, please insert your name on the dates uh, that we have set up. Um, women's ministry catch up is every uh, last Friday of the month. 7.30 p.m. to 10 p.m. at Deaconess Land Park's house. So please join us uh, if you're a woman in the house and we'd like to come together 
for fellowship and just to catch up with one another. Child care is available, so please speak to Deaconess Nan and Jeannie today. Pickleball Tuesday is every Tuesday, 7 p.m., uh, right here in our church in the fellowship hall. Please RSVP and um, uh, and let's 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 come and get some exercise done. <laughs> if you um, um, have been exercising a, uh, a little bit, uh, we like to uh, come together and uh, play some pickleball. And um, once again, please RSVP uh, or if you, if you have any questions, please speak to. Uh, Deacon Greg Park today. Hannah Mission, March 11th, Saturday, early morning. We are preparing breakfast for the homeless, so please come and join us if you can. Um, any questions, please speak to Deaconess Esther. Uh, a couple announcements for our Mercy Ministry. The prom dress drive is still going on, so if you have any prom dresses, uh, they're not you know, being worn anymore, please consider them donating here. Um, you could simply drop them off during the weekday uh, here at our church. And also, uh, there is the uh, clothing drive for men's uh, gently used clothing. Uh, we're still in need, so please, if you have any coats, uh, jackets, any gently worn clothing, uh, please consider donating. Uh, once again, Anytime during the weekday, you can simply just drop them off here at our church. Uh, exciting announcement, Summer Retreat uh, 2023, our RCC Summer Retreat. The date has been set. Uh, please mark this on your calendar. August 11 to 13 at Spruce Lake Retreat Center. Once again, it would be a time of just praise and prayer and fellowship. It would be awesome time together as church. Uh, there we go away for a few days. And um, awesome speaker coming in, praise team. Just being fed spiritually. Um, so once again, mark the date on your calendar, August 11 to 13. Any questions, please uh, speak to Deaconess Helen Park today. Uh, weekly email update. If you are receiving our email update in your... Um, if you're not receiving our email update, please check your uh, spam folder or even the, the promotion folder uh, in your inbox. Please check them. And um, if you're not getting the email at all, please see one of our um, welcoming team servants. Our prayer meetings is um, uh, starting with Sunday. Uh, we have prayer group study every Sunday, 12.30 p.m. in our library for book study and prayer. And uh, coffee break is every Wednesday, 9.30 a.m. in the library as well. And Saturday morning prayer, we have 7 a.m. right here in the main sanctuary. Uh, and pre-worship prayer is every Sunday, 30 minutes before the service in the library to prepare our hearts for worship. Uh, so those are prayer meetings. And prayer ministry would kindly to ask if you could share your prayer request with us. So email could be seen here if you uh, check this email uh, uh, and find this email address on our weekly uh, update even on our website but uh, if you'd like to just share your prayer request with us we'd like to uh, pray with you and pray for you so please uh, send them uh, to this email address please see the chart for the upcoming uh, worship servants uh, we have some uh, clay announcements this coming Friday, as we have FNF every Friday, this coming Friday we uh, are making the FNF as a board game night. So uh, bring your own board, uh, bring your own board game, BYOBG, um, uh, and then we'll just set up stations where we can, you know, play all kinds of board games together. And so bring your own uh, board game, um, 8 p.m. right here in our uh, in our fellowship hall. Uh, join us, Clay. And um, another exciting news is that we have opened our Mexico mission uh, registration. Um, so this whole month, it's, it's, it's open and it's closing, I believe, March 26, 11.30 p.m. sharp. Okay, so if you're thinking about registering, 
uh, reg uh, sending kids. Uh, we're actually opening up to both Clay and Crew. Um, so please consider uh, uh, registering and coming to Mexico. We're going to Tijuana once again. Um, we'll have a separate kind of orientation for our Mexico mission trip, but just wanted to quickly, briefly just go over our new system, registration system we have. Um, if you couldn't, uh, not right now, don't take out your phone now, but uh, on your phone app store, look for, search for Church Center app and simply download. And then you will type in your email address, right? Um, majority, yeah, someone was trying to download. <laughs> If you, um, yeah, I don't think the Bluetooth is connected. Yeah, thank you. Um, moving right along here. Uh, if you look for Church Center app, uh, you will find the app and you download. And then you type in your email address. You will, I think majority of us in here in this room, your profile has been created by our, ad, uh, by our admin. So if you just type in your email address, you will see your name come up or your email address come up. You just click on that and then you sign, you sign in. And then you will uh, see our Riverside Community Church logo sign up. And then you will go to, uh, if you click on the sign up, you'll see our 2023 Mexico mission trip registration page. And you click on that and then you see a register uh, button. And, and after that, it's simple, it's extremely easy to follow. You just register and even the payment now, uh, this year, uh, you can make your online payment uh, with this app. So uh, try this, uh, our clay parents, our crew parents, and if you have any questions, please see me today, you know, during fellowship or even during the week. If you have any questions, please uh, text me or email me. Leave. That is it for all the announcements at this time. Our deacon Yoon will come up to lead us in a congregational and offering prayer. Now let us bow our heads and prepare hearts for prayer. Gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us your son his death and resurrection through his blood that covers us we can gather in your presence today thank you for this amazing blessing and privilege to know you through your son lord we are so limited in our understanding knowledge and capacity we pray that through the help of the holy spirit you will grow us in the knowledge of your infinite word may we know your love more richly and know the holy god that loves us pray that you will open up our hearts and minds to receive your word preached through Pastor Richard. Help us to grow in fear and reverence of you. Help us to know you more. Transform our hearts and renew our minds and help us to grow in our love for you, knowing that you first loved us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. morning. Uh, it's good to be back. Good to be with all of you guys here this morning uh, and seeing all of you uh, once again. Um, I wanted to uh, open up a new series for us as we're thinking through just different ways that we think about specifically our own identity. Uh, and when specifically this identity insofar as it reflects the image of God, right? And so this is the name of the series, Imago Dei. Imago Dei. And today we're going to look at this idea of the original image, the original image of, of God. Uh, when you think about as you were growing up, when you were raised in your household, and I, I don't know what your household was like, I don't know what uh, type of home environment you lived in, whether that was a positive uh, upbringing experience or whether it was a negative upbringing experience, chances are it was a mix of both. Um, but I imagine if you could go back and, and rewind your life and think about the times that you were growing up in your life at an early age, I bet your identity was formed by those people in your household. Specifically, 
your parents, whether you grew up with both parents or a single parent, uh, foster parents or adoptive parents, right? Our identity was formed many times in so many ways by our parents, by those that we were surrounded by. And I think over time, as we grew older, it became, uh, our identity became formed by our friends and, and, and maybe by church and maybe by uh, uh, our youth group or uh, our communities. And, and, and we begin to form our, our identity. But I think when we think back to, when I think back to my upbringing, I think so much of how my parents raised me, how my parents intended to raise me, and how that was a reflection of and, and a development of my own identity. When I think about when I was growing up, uh, my parents were immigrants to America, and you know, by me being sort of assimilated into American culture, I remember just constantly doubting that my parents knew anything about America. You have to understand when, my, my name is Richard, and when I was, you know, raised up in school, Richard was sort of an uncommon name, and I, until I was probably about eight years old, thought my parents made this name up completely. I had never met another Richard in my life, and there was this, and I couldn't really, like, bring it up to them, because I probably also, in the back of my mind, didn't. Like, I knew that I didn't really know what I was talking about. But it was just this sort of lingering doubt that my parents had, like, knew that this was, like, an actual name. The first Richard that I ever encountered was Richard Nixon. And I was like, oh, it's like a real name. And then I was like, but why him? Like, why, why name me after him, right? Uh, but literally, this is one of those, it was like the seed of doubt that was sort of planted in me that my parents just didn't understand the culture, right? Like, and, and here I am as like an eight-year-old looking at my parents being like, oh, you guys don't know anything, right? I mean, just the absurdity of all of this, right? So we begin to think about all of the, the different ways that we begin to form our identity, the questions for me growing up were, you know, am I going to be identified as a Korean? Or am I going to be identified as an American? Or am I going to be identified as Chinese or Japanese by everybody else who happens to meet me because they've never heard of Korean before, right? And so you begin to take on just the different forms of our identity. We begin to form all of the different ways that we think about how we are identified based on all of these different factors, our parents, our friends, our society. You think about when we, when we have little children, if those of you who are blessed to have little children, right, when you see a little young boy, right, and you see him and he, he's, he's, he's running around on the playground or in the fellowship hall and this and that, like, you know, what do you, you come up to him, right? You're like, ah, oh, right? Like you, you wrestle with him, you poke him in the stomach, right? And you're like, oh, you're so strong. You do a, you know, you have him do a pull up on your arm, right? Like all of these different sort of things. And then when you see a little girl, right? You say, oh, you're so cute. Oh, your dress is so pretty. You think about those things, right? What are we reinforcing as their identity, the way that they receive praise in our society? I am inadvertently reinforcing all of these things in these children. We take the sum total of all of those things and we begin to understand our own individual identity. As you sit here on this day, whether you're a teenager or slightly older, you are the sum total of all of these identity experiences. And so recognizing our identity is inescapable, how we see ourselves as an inescapable idea, I want to go back for us, to this idea of an original image, the original image that we were created in. And this is actually the original image of God found in the original man and woman, Adam and Eve. So when we're talking about this Imago Day, we're going to trace through these next month, we're going to trace through the development of the Imago Day as found in us as humans and as individuals. So I'm going to look at the original created image of God in the account of Genesis. But you think about why are we talking about image at all, right? You think about today, we are obsessed 
with our image. We are obsessed with our image. More so than at any other time in history. Now you're sitting there, you're like, I mean, I understand society's obsessed with image, but like, I mean, I think I'm, I think I'm pretty much, you know, I have it in check, right? You know, I, I maintain a balance about my obsession over image. Uh, you know, I mean, but think about this, right? Mirrors, hold on. Mirrors weren't invented until 1835. I wanted you to just think about your house right now for a second. Count how many mirrors are in your house. I mean, it's double digits. I, I bet you it's double digits because there's probably mirrors that you don't even think about, right? For instance, there's our nightstands that are mirrored, right? And so, like, each side of those is technically a mirror. So, I mean, like, there's, like, 15 mirrors on just a nightstand, right? You got mirrors hanging on the wall. You got mirrors in the bathrooms. You got the hand mirrors. You got open up the drawers and you got other mirrors, right? You got compacts. There's tons of mirrors in our houses. And for generations, for millennia, people did not have any mirrors at all. People didn't know fundamentally what they look like. I mean, you think about this for a second. For millennia, people did not know what they looked like. It, it blows your mind. And I can't reach for something on my nightstand without seeing my reflection. So, you know, as a society, as a generation, we are, we are clearly obsessed with our image. Cameras now are everywhere. Uh, I remember... Uh, I'm of the age where I remember phones without cameras. And I remember when phones, uh, cameras on phones were a feature, and I remember scoffing. Who would want a camera on their phone? We have cameras for that, that you can take out of your, you know, little fanny pack and, like, you know, change the battery and all this different things. And now, like, I mean, phones are everywhere. You cannot go around without some sort of camera being, some photo being taken. I remember thinking just philosophically, I was like, I wonder how many photos I am just inadvertently in the background of. Right? Like when you go to Disney World or you go to the World Trade Center or when you go to you know, New York City, Central Park or whatever, like all of these different places where you're just in the background of these photos, cameras are everywhere. In fact, uh, you know, I mean, there are whole apps and, and, and things for us to be able to check our, how we look in, in just going about society. We are constantly bombarded with our image. And don't get me started about what, Zoom looks like, right? The Zoom uh, being able to see ourselves as we are in a meeting, right? To just to be able to, I mean, you can actually pin your own camera in your Zoom meeting to be able to see exactly what you look like. Uh, of course, there are people on the other side where you, they have the hide self view uh, option, which is actually you erase your video completely because you're too distracted from looking at yourselves. Regardless, the point is that we are obsessed with our image. We are constantly being bombarded with what we look like. In fact, uh, there, those of you who are on TikTok, those of you in the room, there's probably a, a small number of you, but those of you who are on TikTok, there's this actual viral uh, trend that is going around. There's this filter that is, uh, it's a special trend that, that, that really basically, it, it changes your image to make you well, basically, look a little bit more like a Kardashian. So we're going to... Is this working? Do you have the sound, Jack? Let's go back. So, man, that's all being done by your phone, right? This, this AI filter that changes your image immediately and ch it matches every single digital, you know, pixel in your face to make you look a certain way, right? I mean, this is we, what we can be, whoever we want to be in some sense. Our obsession with our image centers on what image we want to project to people, what we want to be able to show people. 
what we want to be able to show people. We use makeup and we uh, diet and we exercise. We elect for surgery, all to make sure we are projecting the image that we want to. Narcissus was a... uh, Narcissus, in Greek mythology, was the one who saw his reflection and was so captured by his beauty that he, was, that he could not leave the side of this water, this stream, because he was so enraptured by his beauty. And he ended up dying there, staring at his reflection. And this is, I think, in some ways, a, 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 a critique of us as a society. Thank you, Jack. Let's hear it for Jack. I think this is a, a, a critique of us as a society that we as a society have become so obsessed with our image and even more so. So when we think about this Imago Day, when we think about this original image of God, we go back to the story of the, 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 the passage of scripture that captures God creating man and woman, male and female in his own image. It says this in Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 and 27. It says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So the first thing we need to understand is that we have been created in God's image. And so insofar as God's image is bearing, uh, the, the, the repercussions of that is that what we need to draw our own identity from. And so we recognize that what, what we do as human beings, what we do as, as my own individual self is I reflect, I merely reflect the image of God. And so when we think about this, right, we need to first understand that we are intrinsically beautiful. We are intrinsically beautiful. Our own image of God is intrinsically beautiful. God has made you beautiful. 1 Peter 3 reminds us, your beauty should not come from outward adornments such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. The reinforcement that, that, that our beauty comes from our spirit. Our beauty comes from our soul. Our beauty comes from our character and not from outward adornment. In fact, in a 2019 study, when when respondents were asked, how important are these attributes in making a woman beautiful? Overwhelmingly, the number one, two, three, four, kindness, happiness, dignity, and confidence. The respondents overwhelmingly responded that it is things that are of your spirit and of your soul and of your character that makes someone beautiful. When I evaluate someone else's beauty, I say it is the things that are on the inside that make someone beautiful. I mean, this is statistically significant, right? Our beauty comes from our spirit much more than Facial appearance or skin or body or hairstyle or makeup. What makes a woman beautiful is what is inside, is what is in their spirit and in their character. And by the way, the results were the same for men. Much more than body shape and body fitness and, you know, hairstyle and things like that. Overwhelmingly, we know in the bottom of our hearts that our beauty comes from what is within. We know this, and yet so much of how we live is the opposite. We focus so much on the outward appearance. And you think about just even, you know, doing a, uh, 
uh, you know, resource analysis, right? Like a, a finance analysis. Like how much do we invest in our body weight and shape, our hairstyle, our makeup, uh, you know, our diet, our skin versus our happiness and our dignity and our confidence? Like how much are we investing in our dignity as opposed to our body shape or our hairstyle? Our beauty is intrinsic. We need to recognize that we are intrinsically beautiful from the inside. So perhaps for you, there are some of us that I think could fall on two ends of the spectrum. Maybe there are some of us that whose beauty is too derived from our outward appearance, and maybe we need to focus a little bit more on our character, on our, uh, our spirits and our souls, on the kindness and dignity and confidence and happiness. But on the other side of the spectrum, I think that there are some of us who feel ugly. I think there are some of us who look in these dozens of mirrors we have around our house and we feel ugly. It's the opposite of narcissus. It's not that we are captivated by our beauty, but it is we are repulsed by our perceived ugliness. And so my question to you is, what is the imago Dei, what is the image of God in you tell you about your perceived ugliness. Because the ugliness that you may see is, you know, you may be focusing in on a mirror about, uh, you know, your physical appearance or these sorts of things and not, and, and totally neglecting the intrinsic beauty that you may have on the inside. And the intrinsic beauty that the image of God that you bear as this original image bearer you're denying the beauty that God has created you with. And in fact, I would put forth that one of the ugliest characteristics of someone is someone who is so obsessed with outside, outer, outward beauty. Without somebody who doesn't understand the inner beauty of themselves is oftentimes one of the ugliest characteristics that I can see in someone. Psalm 139 reminds us, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Imagine instead of looking at all of the imperfections on your skin every morning, you reminded yourself, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That I am God's masterpiece. If that was your reminder, if every time you looked in the mirror, that was what you said of yourself. Imagine the power that would unleash in your own identity. So, you know, one thing that as we obsess about our beauty, one thing I, I, I've sort of focused on is, you know, when I was raising my daughter, I have a son and a daughter. When I, I remember when we were raising our daughter, everyone would come up to her, oh, you're so cute. And I would stand by her, you know, she's like three years old, right? And I'd stand by, you know, and I'd be like, and kind and smart and brave right? I would do this constantly. So much so that if, if, if you go to Chloe now and you say, you know, uh, you know, what would your dad say? She's like, and kind and smart and brave, you know, and, and, you know, like, this is like a reinforcement of her. And I remember I would always catch myself because I didn't want to reinforce in her that your, your value is placed on you specifically as a woman, that your value is placed on your physical appearance, And so years, I would reinforce that you are kind and you are brave and you are smart. And then I woke up like when she was like 13 years old and I was like, I've never told my daughter that I thought she was pretty. (laughs) And I was like, by the way, Chloe, you know, I think you're gorgeous. Like, I think you're pretty, but you're also these other things. And I explained it to her and she was like, yes, dad, I get it. I get it. Can we please stop talking about this? Right? But parents... As you are surrounded by children, as as we are surrounded, be careful about what we reinforce in people. And I would say as a society, specifically girls, specifically women, what are we reinforcing in in this generation of women and where their value is derived? Because if it is their kindness and their happiness and their confidence and their dignity, I say go all in. But if it is their skin and their hair and their dress and their, then I think we may be undermining the image of God in them. 
So we need to move on. So we are intrinsically beautiful. The second thing that we need to recognize is that we are intimately belonging, intimately belonging. So in Genesis 1 and 26 and 27, it says that, that, that we are created in the image of God and so that we may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky over the livestock and the wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. And so what I mean by this idea of intimately belonging, what I mean, what I'm saying here is that we belong to God. We are aligned with God and God has created us for a purpose. And so the original image of God in us is one that aligns us with a purpose. In Genesis, he's like, I want you to rule. I want you to to have authority over the things of this world. And we'll talk a little bit more about this the next sermon in this series. But we belong to a purpose. God has created you in his image for a purpose. Insofar as I imagine that there have been times of your life where you have been engaging in a certain activity and you feel like this this a sense of satisfaction that you were like, I'm made for this. Like, I love this. Like, this is why I live. And I imagine that there are times in your life where you are doing something, you're like, what am I doing? Like, why am I spinning my wheels? Just engaging in this activity just feels so misaligned with the purpose of God. And I believe that this is a reflection of the image of God in you bearing a reflection to say this is what you were created for when you're out there serving and helping and and, and praying and and ministering to people. There's a sense of satisfaction, a sense of alignment, a sense of this is why I was created in the image of God. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8 says, Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. So essentially, do whatever you do unto the Lord so that we can reflect the image of God. Romans 14, 8 says, If we live we live for the Lord. If we die, we live, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Every activity between life and death, every activity should be a reflection of the Imago Dei in us. And so for some of you, maybe you feel lost. Maybe your life doesn't align with this purpose that God has created you for. And so, you know, in fact, last night I was having a conversation with someone who was basically saying, like, you know, what, how do I reclaim sort of my faith, right? There are certain activities that make me feel like I'm aligned with the purpose of God, but, but how do I reclaim this, this faith? And I would say, if you're feeling lost, if you're feeling misguided, if you're feeling you're waking up and saying, what am I doing today? Like, what am I spinning my wheels for? Find avenues, find ways for you to be able to serve the people of God in your work, in your life. And it could take a whole host of different things. It doesn't mean that you need to quit your job and and move overseas to, you know, help out the Mexico mission trip. It doesn't mean those things. It doesn't mean you need to quit your job, but it means, it could mean that you need to find more purpose in how you do your job. Right? Some of you, as managers at your workplace, there's a way that you could serve the purpose of God in how you manage people, in how you perform at your job, in how you do your work. So if you feel lost, dive into this intimate belonging to the purpose of God. Third point I want to say comes from Psalm 39, verse 6, which says, Surely a man goes about as a shadow. This is in the English Standard Version. Uh, Surely man goes about, people go about as a shadow. And the word in the, the Old Testament there, shadow, sometimes it gets translated as ghost, sometimes it gets translated as phantom, but in sometimes it also gets translated as image. 
So when you think about what a shadow is, right, what is a shadow? A shadow is just actually a poor reflection of the original source, right? So this is a, a picture of a shadow, and if, you, you know, it's, a, it's sort of a poor reflection, but I, I, I guarantee you, uh, if, if you're in a relationship, at some point in time, you've taken the same cheesy photo. I mean, this is Teresa and I on our honeymoon in Barcelona because we're standing there and I see the shadow, it's behind us. And so I was like, oh, let's take the picture. Mind you, there were no phones with cameras back then. This was like a photo uh, of our shadows. But this is what it is, right? And why do we take this photo? Because we recognize this is just a reflection of who we are. Right? This is a poor reflection, but it's a, it's a reflection nonetheless of who we are. People of God, we are mere shadows of God. We are shadows of God. As we think about the original image of God created in us, we are just simply images of God, reflections of God. We go about living our lives as these reflections of God. One of the things, I, this isn't in my notes, but one of the, the, the images that I have of, of, uh, of this is captured in, in a picture of the moon, right? You picture the moon, right? The moon, as it sits in this bright night sky, and it gives light. I mean, you could walk by moonlight, right? It's just a beautiful thing. The moon does not give off light. You realize this, right? The, the moon is a rock in space. And so how does the moon in our night sky give off light? It is reflecting the sun. We are just moons. We are just shadows that are reflecting God's light to the world. And so we need to be as shadows, people that image who God is to this world. So we need to remember we are image bearers. We are the ones that reflect who God is to the world. So how we live, how we talk, how we work, how we love, how we minister, how we reach, bears the image of God, the imago Dei. To the world. We are reflections of Him. Colossians 2 17 says, There are a shadow of the thing, these are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. We are a shadow before the reality. Nobody looks at the shadow of me and Teresa and is like, Oh, I know them, right? But when you recognize and you put them next to the original, you know, people, then you go, oh, I see. Now it makes sense. We need to be shadows of God. Not so that people worship the shadows, but they look at the shadow and when they encounter God, they go, I see it now. It makes sense. We are image bearers. 2 Corinthians 3 says this, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the, the Lord's glory which is actually another word for the word reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. We are being ever-transformed into his glory to reflect to the world. So the question for us, is the people at your work, the people in your neighborhood, the people who serve you coffee in the morning, the the people who you've raised as your children, the people who you spend Thanksgiving with, the people that you go to church with, if all of those people had no image of God, had no experience with God, and only their image of God was what you reflected, what would their God look like? I mean, at church, like, you know, I mean, I serve, I, I preside, I stand in worship, like I join small groups and this and that. So maybe your God at church would, would look pretty, pretty good. What about at work? What about in that meeting where you're delivering tough news or whether you're receiving tough news or when you get involved in a territorial bat match at work, with another coworker, right? Like, what is the, 
the image of God, what image of God are you reflecting? If you were the only image of God that people saw in the world, what would their God look like? See, being an image bearer is not saying just, oh, yes, this is great. I get to, you know, be the, 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 the reach the people of God. But it's, it's, a, it's a responsibility. It's a, it's a reflection for me to be able to say, I need to bring this image of God into every situation. What does is, what is your God love? What does he hate? What does he care about? What does he ignore? What are the things that he engages in? You know, I think one of the things that is, that is often very difficult in our world today is that the name of Christ, the name of God is being used, and I would say the word weaponized in so many ways on both sides of issues. And so in the name of Christ, we are pushing people further and further away from the actual true image of God because of our own agendas, because of our own issues and desires and stances. I remember I was in seminary a long time ago, and uh, my seminary professor, he is this, he's a Korean-American guy, he's this real staunch, you know, a real low voice, and he talked in like, you know, seven-syllable words, like, when he, uh, like literally I would, I would, I would, open up a glossary on my computer as he was talking because I would, he would say these words that I wouldn't understand and I would have to translate it like as he was speaking. But so there's like this very staunch uh, uh, theolo- theology professor, like the perfect picture of what a theolo- theology professor would look like. And uh, I remember he was talking about the image of God and he ended the lesson and then he came in the next lesson and he was like, I remember we were talking about the image of God and, and the beauty of the image of God. And he's like, and I found this song. I was driving along and my, my, you know, my wife or my son was like, you know, picked the radio station. And so he's like, I heard this song. And he was like, yes, this is what captures the, the beauty of the image of God. And he says it was this song, Beautiful, by Christina Aguilera. And then, yeah, exactly. People started laughing in the room because we were like, oh, oh, okay. You know, a theology prof is listening to Christina Aguilera. Like, there's a little bit uh, something funny about that, right? And then he said, I was so captivated by the song, like almost brought to tears. And then he said he went home and he was just wanted to listen to it again. So he went on YouTube and he went on the internet to find, to, you know, to listen to it. And that's when he saw the video of the song. Jack? <laughs> I think you get the point. The the, the sound is not working, but you can YouTube it when you get home. So he says he goes home and he he watches this video and he's like, oh, this is slightly different than the context I was putting it in, right? And the, the, the laughter in the room when he said beautiful by Christina Aguilera was because we had all seen the video. We, we knew, you know, what the video was. And so we were like, oh, you know, that's an interesting theological, you know, example. And what he said, and I, just, I still remember this, and I'm so glad he said it. But, you know, conservative evangelical theology professor who in his ignorance is quoting Christina Aguilera and the song Beautiful. And, you know, the, the video, this is just a snip of the video, but the, the video is is really in, in engaging with this idea of, of, of uh, gay lifestyle, transgender, and you know, people who are outcasts in society. And he said, so I was faced with this sort of conundrum, right, of like, oh, like, what do I think about this, right? If I'm talking about the image of God, and this is clearly the agenda of the video. And then he said, but I was confronted with the fact that if I'm going to believe in the image of God, 
as in place in human beings, it has to extend to these people. That I can't now sim- simply sit there and say, because of their activity that they engage in, because of their philosophy of, of, of sexual orientation, that I reject now the image of God. Instead, he said, actually, no, no, no. That this video is, is, is a challenge for me about what I really believe about the image of God as image bearers. Do we believe that as human beings, we are made in the original image of God? Oh, but, 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 but what about their activity? What about their lifestyle? What about that? No, 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 no. We're not talking about their lifestyle. We are saying that we, in, as human beings, have been created in the image of God, that as fundamental human beings, we are created in the image of God. Doesn't mean that we are created because of how we act or what we believe or how we live. But actually, the, the fact that we are created as human beings is a reflection of our identity in Christ. This song came out in 2002. It was 21 years ago. So you think about, like, you know, some of you may feel, like, a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, you're going to send an email to, you know, uh, Elder Paul and be like, you know, uh, I might take the next few weeks off, right? But some of you are feeling uncomfortable. It's 2023. Imagine in 2002, in a room full of conservative evangelical seminarians, the fact that he was putting this forward as image bearers of God. And so I started thinking about this as I was preparing this message. I was thinking about what does the Imago Dei look like in our divided world? If we, if we truly believe in the image of God as originally created in human beings, I think so much of our division in America, so much of our division in society, whether you're talking about cops and criminals or Democrats and Republicans or progressive Christians and fundamentalists or uh, transgender or conservative evangelicals. I think so much of what is breaking this, this divide apart is stopping seeing the other side as image bearers of Christ, as image bearers of God, that being made in the image of God. In the name of Christ, we are looking at and demonizing the other side and saying there's no way that anyone with a, with a heart should believe in that other side. Now, I'm not saying anything about those stances, okay? This is not that sermon. What I am saying is, if you are so staunch in your beliefs on one side of the issue, that you demonize the other side. You are denying the image of God in that human being. And if you can come out of your own theological stance, your own beliefs, your own stance, and and, and get outside of that and, and enter into the experience of the other side, I think you'll be able to see more and reclaim the the foundational understanding of the image of God as as born in this person. Again, I don't I don't want to take a stance. This is not that sermon, but I'll tell you about a little experience that that my wife and I had. Now, you know, I'm in I'm in my I'd say mid forties. We'll say mid. We'll round down. So I'm in my mid forties, right? And um you know, growing up, there are some younger people here in this room, right? And if I asked you, I won't, but if I asked you, how many of you know somebody who is gay or somebody who is transgender? Uh, you know, I guarantee you, every single young person's hand would go up. Every single young person's hand. And if I asked everybody who was uh, my age and up, I won't, and I said, how many of you knew someone who was gay or who was transgender? Probably not a hand would go up. Now, I, I did not know anybody that was out when I was in high school. I knew people that were gay, but they were not out, if you know what I mean. Because in the society at the time, people just did not come out, at least in the towns that I lived in. And so, you know, I didn't grow up around somebody who was gay. I didn't grow up around somebody who was transgender. And regardless of what you feel along these issues, regardless of how you fit them into your theological categories, 
I had not spent any significant time with anybody who was transgender. Any, I've heard of stories. I've heard of kids in my friend's school who has transitioned, you know, as a, as a child. And, you know, we've engaged in all of these different things. I've gone to church with people that have. But I've not really spent any time listening to someone, someone's story. My wife and I ended up through a course of, you know, uh, a, a series of, of, you know, online social media interactions. I ended up stumbling upon this YouTube of somebody who was telling their transition story. Now, what I want to say is, you know, I mean, sure, you could see a bunch of these different transition stories. What was specifically compelling about this transition story was someone who had grown up in a church as a worship leader. Um, and, and, and like, I mean, if, if th- this person was also Korean American, and I was like, I went to church with someone like Like, I know who this person is. I've never met this person, but I know who this person is. I know who was the worship leader at the retreats, uh, you know, in in, the leader in the church, right? The the marriage, when they get married, like, everybody's rooting for them because, like, the, the two, like, superstar Christians are the ones who are getting married. And then this person transitioned when they were 30, two years into their marriage, and they go through the story, and I won't give you all the details now. If you actually want us to, to watch it, um, come up to me afterwards, and I'll, I'll, I can send you the link. Um, but what was, what was fascinating for me was the first time, for me, it was like an hour and a half long, right? So for me to spend the time hearing the story and the journey, and it wasn't put in a Christian context. In fact, it was actually the opposite. It, it, but hearing that person's story, hearing that person's journey, it was compelling for me to hear that person's life and to journey with them at least over YouTube, right? To be able to hear that story and to humanize that person's experience, not to demonize that person's experience, to humanize that person's experience. That again, regardless of where you feel on the issue, regardless of what you think theologically, but to be able to enter into that person's experience and see the image of God, to see and confront what does the image of God look like in someone that has a different experience than you, was something for me that was very enlightening. And you see, I think so many things for us nowadays, in our culture, in our society, politically, sexually, spiritually, religiously, there's so many things that are driving us apart. But if we believe in the Imago Dei, if we believe that we are created in the image of God, that we all are created in the image of God, then that should inform how we treat people that fundamentally disagree with us because we are still created in the image of God. Now, I know that there's a lingering pocket in in your minds that are thinking, but what about the differences? What about the the, the violations of that image of God? And yes, we are going to talk about that in this series. But suffice to say for today that if we believe in the original image of God, that we are created intrinsically beautiful, intimately belonging to his purposes and image bearers of Christ. Even when somebody disagrees with us fundamentally, we should be able to see and reclaim the image of God in all of us. Let us pray. I'm gonna just give you about uh, 30 seconds just to respond just quietly in your own heart and in your own mind. And then I'll close for us.
Lord, as we, as we read about how we are created in your image, Lord, there's so many things that, that, that bears in us. There's so many things that, that, that has purpose in us about how we see ourselves and, and, and the reason why we live and how we engage and represent you to others. But it also affects how we see others around us. And so, God, I pray that you would challenge each one of us here because I imagine if we probe deep enough into the way that we view other people, there's some segment of society that we have a hard time seeing as image bearers of Christ. And so, God, would you challenge us? Would you help us? Would you renew in us a fundamental faith in the image of God? And Lord, as we partake of your body and your blood, we are reminded of the restored and renewed image of Christ that is found through you on the cross. Amen. This time we'll move into a time of communion. For those of us who have been baptized, who have been confirmed, please take out your communion element. You have not received the communion element, please raise your hand and I'll, our welcoming team will I'll go around and give you the communion element. Once again, for those of us who have been baptized or confirmed, you receive the communion. Hear now the word of the institution of the Holy Supper. On the night of his arrest, Jesus gathered his disciples. He took the bread after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to them, gave it to them and saying, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So church, go ahead and take the time with it all. It's the body of Christ given for us. In the same way, he took the cup. After giving thanks to God, he gave it to the disciples and saying, Take, drink, this is the new covenant sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Church, go ahead and take the second. It's the blood of Christ shed for us. Church, every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord, Jesus Christ, until he comes again. This time, if you're able, please stand and let us cite our Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
Blessing that comes uh, as a reiteration of a verse that I read in the sermon, which is 2 Corinthians 3 18, which says this And we all who with unveiled faces reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Amen. Thank you. 